This video covers the standard operating procedure for the Horiba Floramax 4 spectrofluorimeter. Please be aware that we will cover just the basic operating procedures. More can be found in the operation manual next to the instrument. First turn the power to the instrument on by using the switch on the right hand side of the instrument. Next, turn the power on for the computer screen. It may already be on. Then turn the power on to the computer. From the desktop, launch the fluorescence software by clicking the rainbow colored icon. The first thing we'll do in this demonstration is to check the system performance. This is a standard procedure and should be done every day this instrument is used. We will check the calibration of the excitation monochromator for wavelength accuracy first. Be sure the lid is closed to the sample compartment. Open the experimental menu by clicking on the button with the capital M along the toolbar at the top right side of the screen. When the menu appears, click the word Spectra. In the next dialog box, choose the term Excitation. The next page allows the operator to set various wavelengths for operating the monochromators. The default settings are actually the appropriate ones for this calibration process. Merely click the Run button in the lower right hand corner. This will scan the monochromator that selects the wavelength of the light going from our xenon light source into the sample compartment. A small fraction of the light beam is split out and is focused onto a photodiode that the instrument maker refers to as the reference detector. We don't actually need a real sample here since we are merely monitoring the intensity of the light from our lamp as a function of wavelength. At the end of the scan, the data will be redisplayed on a white background. In order to activate some of the features of the data analysis package, double click the left hand mouse button with the cursor positioned somewhere inside the graph. From the toolbar at the top of the screen, click the cursor button that looks like a miniature window. Then click the left mouse button while positioning the cursor somewhere near the tallest peak on the graph. If necessary, use the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard to put the cursor at the very summit of this tallest peak. This is the most intense emission from the xenon discharge lamp and is known to have a wavelength of 467 nanometers. This value should appear as the X coordinate in the green print inside the black rectangle. If that is not the number that is displayed, the instrument must be recalibrated. If you need to do this, see page 3-6 in the operation manual that is kept in the blue and white box beside the instrument. Next, we'll check the wavelength calibration for the emission monochromator. Our standard will be the Raman scattered light associated with the oxygen-hydrogen bond stretching vibration from water. We will use a quartz sample cuvette that is kept in the small box in the right hand drawer beneath the spectrometer. Use a disposable pipette to fill it about two thirds of the way full with deionized water. Since the excitation and the emission light pass through the windows in the lower half of the cuvette, handle the cuvette carefully only near the top. Place the cuvette into the holder inside the sample compartment and close the lid. Click the icon with the capital M for the experimental menu from the top toolbar. Click on Spectra and then choose Emission and click Next. Once again, the default parameters are set for exactly what we need for this calibration experiment. There's no need to adjust them. Click the Run button in the lower right hand corner. When the instrument is done scanning, it will display the spectrum in a white background. Put the cursor somewhere inside the graph and double click the left hand mouse button. Resize the new graph. Choose the window shaped cursor from the toolbar at the top of the screen and click the cursor somewhere near the maximum intensity on the peak. If necessary, use the right and left arrow keys on the keyboard to position the cursor at the very summit of the peak. If the peak value does not appear at 397 nanometers, 
recalibrate the emission monochromator by referring to the procedure on pages 3-7 to 3-9 in the operation manual kept in the blue-white box next to the instrument. Now let's consider recording spectra for an unknown sample. We usually need to do a preliminary scan or two before we can choose the optimum wavelength at which to excite the sample as well as to record the most intense emission. Often we can make an initial guess of a suitable emission wavelength based on the sample's initial color. Here we see a sample solution that has a yellow-green emission when illuminated with a UV light. Green light falls somewhere in the ballpark of 500 to 550 nanometers. If you don't happen to know that, consult a table such as this one from page 398 in the 8th edition of Harris's Quantitative Analysis textbook. Based on that, I'm going to guess that 520 nanometers would be a good wavelength to collect strong emission from the solution. As before, use the M icon to open up the experimental menu. Choose Spectra. We'll do an excitation experiment first, then click Next. I want to set the wavelength for the emission monochromator to 520 nanometers. I would also like to have good wavelength resolution, so I will set the spectral slit width to 1 nanometer for both monochromators. For the excitation scan, 200 nanometers is the shortest wavelength that I can use for the start of my scan. I'll start here, but I'll, I will want to stop before I get to 520 nanometers. I never want to set both monochromators at the same wavelength at the same time that situation would flood a lot of light into the photomultiplier detector. That treatment would burn out the detector prematurely. So I will stop at least 5 nanometers short at 515 nanometers. From now on we want to save our spectra with appropriate file names. Click in this field at the top and be sure it gets saved to a folder or directory of your own making. On the left side of the screen, click on the Detectors icon. Look at the table at the center of the screen and be sure that the two detectors marked S1 and R1 are both enabled. These refer to the emission or sample detector and reference detector, respectively. Recall that the emission light that we collect from the sample is proportional to the intensity of the light that we use to excite the sample. We've already seen that the lamp spectrum changes with wavelength. If we merely plot the raw intensity of the fluorescent light coming to the sample detector, the variations that have been observed in the lamp intensity will lead to distortion in the spectrum for our molecule. However, we can eliminate this problem if we divide the intensity at the sample detector by the intensity at the reference detector. That is, we should plot S1 over R1 as our signal. In general, S1 over R1 is normally what we should be measuring as our signal. In the table marked Signal Algebra at the bottom of the screen, click S1, then the division operator, then R1, and add the expression to the formula table. The raw signals for S1 and R1 are not that useful here, so we'll remove them from the table to the right. Click the Run button. Once again, when the run is complete, double-click inside the white area of the graph before working up the data. Using the window-like cursor, we can see that the most intense fluorescence occurs when the exciting line is at 488 nanometers. Let's use that wavelength to excite the sample and perform an emission scan. From the main menu, choose Spectra, then select Emission and hit Next. Set the excitation monochromator to 488. Keep the spectral slit widths at 1 nanometer. Since the emitted light will appear at longer wavelengths than the excitation wavelength, I'll start at 495 and go to 650 nanometers. Once again, we want to avoid the condition where we have both monochromators at the same wavelength at the same time. Check to see that the detectors are at S over R. Click Run. 
Now that the run is complete, we can see that the maximum emission intensity appears at a wavelength of 510 nanometers. It is very common practice to plot both the excitation scan and the emission scan on the same graph. We have an emission scan recorded under the optimum conditions, but we should do one more excitation scan in order to display the spectrum under ideal conditions as well. If we record an excitation scan from 200 to 505 nanometers while collecting the emitted light at 510 nanometers, we can display the optimized spectra together. Here is the new excitation scan. Choose the overlay icon from the toolbar on the top left side, and a table will appear where we'll put the list of spectra to overlay. Right now it lists only the most recent scan. To get the list of other spectra, pull the menu graphs down and it will appear with the other spectra taken in this project. I select the most recent emission scan and it moves to the list for the overlay. Clicking OK and the graph appears. This instrument does not have its own printer, nor is the computer connected to the internet. However, you can save your data to a flash drive as a PDF or a JPEG file. From the File pull-down menu, you can find Save as a PDF, or you can export it in different formats. If you save it to this computer, be sure you put it in your own file folder so you can find it. Here I'm showing saving a JPEG to a flash drive that I can take away to my own computer. At the end of the day, clean up the cuvette by rinsing it with deionized water several times. Do a final rinse with methanol, and then you can put that in the box wet with methanol. Remember to turn the power on the instrument and the computer off, and sign the logbook for your time.